um, uh, this uh, meeting is being uh, webcast. So I'll start again, actually. Apologies, the webcast hasn't started. So uh, welcome to uh, the Cabinet meeting of Surrey County Council. Uh, this meeting will be webcast uh, for those that, that aren't uh, on the call or in the meeting itself. Um, can I remind uh, members, please, of, of the usual uh, meeting etiquette? Uh, I'll leave my camera on at all times uh, during the meeting. Um, and uh, if you could please um, uh, turn your microphones on when you speak and turn them off when you have finished speaking. Um, uh, if you're having broadband connection problems, then um, certainly feel free to turn your cameras off, uh, the cabinet that is. Uh, but equally, you can leave them on if you um, prefer. Uh, there is uh, a chat function and a raise hand function on this system. So if you would like to speak on any item, could you please uh, raise your hand or put something in the chat? Um, if, which has been known, I miss that for some reason, um, perhaps somebody can just interrupt to remind me that, uh, that you've asked uh, to speak. Um, although it's recorded, it also will be minuted and those minutes will be published uh, in the usual uh, way. Uh, this is, of course, a meeting in public uh, rather than a public meeting, although residents do have the opportunity to submit questions in advance. And we do, in fact, uh, have some which we will uh, deal with at the appropriate time uh, in the agenda. Um, can I just uh, introduce um, Joanna Killian, Chief Executive, who will uh, be joining us on this call uh, alongside Paul Evans, uh, the Monitoring Officer, and Lee, How Lee Whitehouse, um, the Finance Director, the Section 151 Officer. Uh, and there will be other, uh, other officers uh, from other directors and from committee services uh, with us as well. So uh, I'll just start by um, doing a roll call um, for Cabinet members. Uh, when I call out your name, could you just please turn on your camera um, uh, and just introduce yourself and confirm that you are present. Um, starting with Mary Lewis. Good afternoon, Mary Lewis, Cabinet Member for Children, Young People and Families Wellbeing. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Julie Isles. Good afternoon, Julie Isles, Cabinet Member for All Age Learning. Sinead Mooney. Thank you, Leader. Sinead Mooney, Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care, Public Health and Domestic Abuse. Thank you. Uh, Matt Furness. Hello, Matt Furness, Cabinet Member for Transport. Mel Few. Good afternoon, Cabinet Member for Resources. Thank you. Natalie Bramhall. Good afternoon, Cabinet Member for Environment and Climate Change. Thank you. Zoli Grant Duff. Good afternoon, Cabinet Member for Corporate Support. Alison Griffiths. Good afternoon, Deputy Cabinet Member for Place. Thank you, Marissa Heath. Good afternoon, um, Deputy Cabinet Member for People Portfolio. Thank you. Becky Rush. Hello, I'm the Deputy Cabinet Member for Finance and Resources. Uh, and Edward Hawkins. Good afternoon, Edward Hawkins, Deputy Cabinet Member for Property. Thank you. Um, we have a policy for absence um, from uh, Colin Kemp uh, and also, oh, I'm sorry, Denise, did I miss you out? Apologies. Good Leader, good afternoon, Denise Tanner Stewart, Cabinet Member for Communities. Yeah, very sorry, I jumped over you for some reason. Um, uh, yes, so just to confirm, apologies from uh, Colin Kemp. Uh, and also Mark Newty, um, who's the uh, deputy, uh, deputy cabinet member, uh, will be joining us a, a little later on. Um, the next item then, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 27th of October 2020. Um, unless anybody indicates to the contrary, I assume that those are agreed. Can't see any objections, so thank you very much. Uh, next item then is declarations of interest. Are there any, any declarations, any interest to declare? Can't see any, so thank you very much. OK, and then just before we go into the formal agenda, I just wanted to um, start by making a few, uh, just a few comments. Um, uh, you know, it's been an interesting uh, uh, week or so uh, since our, certainly since our last cabinet meeting. 
um, with uh, the progress that has been made in relation to the vaccines. Uh, I think that for all of us um, gives us some hope and some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, as of today, uh, where it's not clear which tier uh, we will be put into as uh, Surrey County, as uh, Surrey, um, and we'll only know that I imagine on Thursday when that's formally announced. Um, the, however, I think it is important for uh, all of us to remind ourselves that, that uh, the the vaccine or the proposed vaccine is not a panacea uh, in, in terms of, of the here and now. Um, and as always, I would remind residents to just, uh, uh, you know, just to, to um, comply with the basic rules of, of washing your hands, keeping a safe distance uh, and where appropriate uh, using face coverings. I think if all uh, if all residents stick with those basic rules and that's our best hope uh, in keeping the spread of this virus as contained as uh, we possibly can. Uh, across Surrey, the numbers are starting to show a small uh, decline of, of COVID positive uh, re residents, which, which is good news. There are, however, and there continue to be some spikes in, in different boroughs. So there is absolutely no uh, reason for us to, to be complacent. Um, the, the numbers are published uh, on the website, so residents do have an opportunity to see that direction of travel. But, but we, we, we mustn't read too much into uh, into those numbers in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, the, the us being out of the uh, out of the woods here in, in any sense. I think it's it's very clear to uh, to all of us um, the just the enormous impact that COVID nineteen has had, not just across the world, you know, or the country, but but within the county. Uh, and later on in the agenda, uh, we we will just look at um, a community impact assessment report. Uh, which is a, a really good piece of work uh, that, that highlights uh, the disproportionate impact COVID has had on many of our existing vulnerable communities uh, and individuals. Uh, and that in itself has helped us um, revise and review our priorities uh, as, as an authority. Um, last year, we spent a lot of time with partner organisations and with residents uh, uh, looking at um, our 2030 vision, what is it that this uh, county wanted to do? What, what, what were its ambitions? And its single main ambition was to uh, ensure that no one was left behind. Uh, and that meant tackling inequality across the county, inequality of health and inequality of opportunity. And those are our guiding lights. Those are the things that, that everything we do runs uh, through um, the, the, you know, the, the, those themes uh, and, and we built on those in the sense that we've now refined the four sort of priority areas uh, that will help us deliver that ambition uh, and those four are to grow a sustainable economy so that everyone can benefit uh, you know it is the single biggest issue I think for most residents now is it is around uh, their job security or indeed if they've uh, very sadly lost lost their job um, what what can we do as an authority alongside all the other organizations uh, to, uh, to to rebuild uh, our economy and to get people that want to work back into work you know we are particularly uh, exposed in terms of uh, uh, the aviation industry in the north and the south of this county uh, and and we will work as hard as we possibly can uh, to do what we can to to provide that support. Uh, and where appropriate, um, help people retrain. So the, 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 the economy, uh, standing back up the economy is, is, is a central, central theme to everything actually um, beyond that. Uh, the, the second main area for us is ta tackling health inequalities. I say that the, the COVID has really highlighted uh, you, what we already knew, but has exacerbated those inequalities. Uh, across the county and that is something that we will do we work hard with Surrey Hartman's health system uh, to uh, to address that wherever we possibly can and particularly mental health uh, we had a very um, good I think an informative uh, mental health summit last week with with all of our key partners uh, many people uh, through this this through COVID through uh, isolation uh, and and just not being able to mix with friends and family you know, are, are beginning to experience uh, mental health issues um, and we must 
uh, do what we can to to support those people, um, certainly from uh, deteriorating any further, but to access the services that, that will help. And there are we have a, a mental health hub that that, that that can be accessed through through our websites and so on. Uh, but we must do more and will do more. Uh, and then the last two, um, what the third one is to uh, enable a greener a greener future. Uh, and we've got some items on this agenda, I think, which um, uh, which support that 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 agenda. And it's it's hugely important uh, that we hit our uh, our targets in terms of um, carbon emissions. Uh, that does necessitate not just action on the part of this authority, but also action from residents. Um, the active travel schemes um, that, that we've been uh, looking to uh, implement across the county in, in areas, you know, which are to, to make it easier for people to walk and to cycle, has to be said, have not always met uh, with uh, unanimous support. Uh, we did receive over six million of additional funding for the second tranche, uh, um, but uh, those schemes will only be rolled out where there is genuine, uh, a genuine desire by the local community to see them to see them implemented. And just to, to point out, because I know this has been raised on a number of occasions, uh, that where there are these temporary schemes in place at the moment, they will only be made permanent, if at all, and um, following detailed consultation uh, with residents. And that leads into the last one, which is about engaging uh, more effectively and empowering our communities. You know, we, we want to make sure that, that we uh, play our part um, in delivering what it is that uh, the communities want. We can't overpromise and we won't overpromise, um, but we can engage and we can listen uh, and we can discuss uh, what uh, what initiatives uh, there may be that will uh, improve and, and support uh, your communities. And starting with your fund, Surrey, which we launched last week, uh, which I think is a fantastic initiative uh, for for communities to pr bring forward schemes that, that are legacy schemes. Uh, th this is not about just highways issues, which I know are always prevalent in people's minds, but about things that in their community that, that will really uh, make the experience uh, that much um, that much better. So uh, I think on that note, um, we'll, we'll move on to the agenda. As a, there is, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy agenda, so we'll move forward at a sensible pace, um, but uh, we will take the next item now, which are members' questions. Um, and there are four of those, um, starting with a question from uh, Will Foster um, to Julie Isles. Will, was there a supplementary question you had? Um, thank you, Councillor Oliver. I'll put them together, if that's OK, for speed. Sure. Um, obviously, just to thank the Cabinet member for the answer on the first one and for the staff taking up this issue and pursuing the government to properly fund post-16 education, so I'm grateful for that. Regarding the second question, I am concerned about how long it is taking the council to decide what to do with the Manor site and several other um, empty sites. This one's been empty since 2008. Will we to dispose of the plans by part two? Well, sorry, I, I I couldn't hear that last bit of that question. I don't know about anybody else. Could you just repeat that for us? I, sorry about that. Um, so will the Cabinet member agree to disclose what is uh, being considered for the Manor School site but via part two? OK, thank you. Um, Julie Biles. I think, Councillor Forster, it won't be very long at all until you have some uh, further information about this site. So if we can just leave it for, there for today, I will get back to you as soon as possible. OK, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Will. Um, and then the next two questions um, were from Jonathan Essex, the first to Natalie Bramhall. Um, Jonathan. Um, Thank you. May I follow um, Will's lead and take them two together and, and thank Natalie for her for her response and say no further question, no further question on that one. And just move straight to the last one, um, which was the question and the answer was from Cabinet Member Matt Furness. Um, I'd like to thank him for his answer and and note that, you know, I, I appreciate it. It is difficult to provide full disability access for electric vehicles. I think there are problems with that going forward, but I'm glad that he's confirmed that that, that won't be a problem in our case. Um, 
But just the question is, is noting, I think that we're looking at something like 60 or 80 of the buses and, and 50 minibuses, whereas there's a total fleet of around 800. Uh, what's what's the level of ambition for us to have a completely zero carbon bus fleet in Surrey? Like by what date are you aiming for? Thank you, uh, Leader. Uh, thank you, Councillor Essex. Uh, yes, as you can see, we have in the papers uh, this afternoon uh, a massive investment, probably one of the largest across a county in the whole of the UK, uh, into low emission uh, buses. Uh, it's actually between 70 and 80 ultra low or zero emission buses. Uh, and this will allow a cascading effect of the less polluting models of Euro 6 and Euro 5 emission rating. And we'll continue to work with operators. As you know, it's about 46% uh, of all carbon emissions in Surrey come from transport. So the more that we can do uh, to remove uh, the higher polluting ones from our roads, uh, the more that we can start hitting our, our vision of uh, 2050 uh, for when we become a carbon neutral across the county. And uh, I think actually 11% uh, of the existing buses being re replaced in, in our first initiative uh, is quite something to be um, celebrating about rather than uh, anything else. So uh, is our ambition. We have are working with our partners. We have set these uh, uh, climate change de declaration targets uh, and we will be meeting them. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Matt. Jonathan, are you happy with that? Thank you. Yeah. OK, thanks very much. Um, then we have two questions from the public and um, the first from um, Sally Blake. I don't think there's a I don't think Sally's with us, so there's no supplementary. No, I think that's right. Uh, and then the second is from um, Councillor Paul Kennedy. Um, Paul. Uh, thank you, Councillor Oliver, for your very helpful explanation of, of both the methodology, including the meaning of specimen date uh, and the purpose of the Council's daily updates, which is to provide a robust week on week comparison to illustrate the evolution of local infections over time. Uh, and for that purpose, I do accept that a five day, five day delay is appropriate. Uh, my worry and my supplementary question relate to the public presentation of this as a daily update, which I'm afraid is still leading to misunderstandings on social media, in emails and so on. People do still assume, I'm afraid, it, it's just a cumulative Surrey equivalent of the daily updates provided by the UK government. And it continues to be used primarily as a sort of borough and district league table. Um, I can see that the report itself uh, provides much more explain, explanation than it used to uh, even a few days ago, which is helpful. And, and I'm not expecting an immediate response from you, but, but can you please think about the overall presentation to the public, including the name Daily Update? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, no, that, it, it's a good point. Um, and I think will be particularly relevant as we move into a new tiered structure um, you know, uh, I don't know which tier Surrey will be in, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everybody will want to know uh, if we are not in tier one, you know, what what um, what we need to do and, uh, you know, to, to to move into tier one if we were in tier two, for example. So I think I think there will be a lot of interest in, in the accuracy of these these numbers. So I'll take that back to the director of public health, Ruth Hutchinson, um, and to the comms team. Uh, and let's see what we can do to make it absolutely clear to residents kind of what, what that data is telling them. So thank you for that. Um, OK, thank you. Well, that's the end of the questions. Uh, we'll move on to item 4C. There are no petitions uh, 4D. There were no representations received on reports to be considered in private. Uh, there were no reports from select committees. Uh, so item 6 then, uh, there were two decisions uh, to report. The first, um, was uh, by um, Mel Few, the cabinet member for finance. Uh, Mel, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I'd just like to update the cabinet uh, to advise that uh, there are 111 properties which need to be transferred uh, from uh, various ownerships following our decision to change the relationship with Surrey Wildlife Trust. And so far, 23 have been completed and 70 will be completed by year end and it leaves us with eight to go and those have some particular individual complexes which we'll resolve as we move forward otherwise there's nothing else 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, and the second decision was mine, um, which related to um, the creation of a new school by the amalgamation of um, Christchurch, a Church of England Infant School and Englefield Green Infant School. Um, I have nothing further to add to that. Um, OK, so item seven then um, is our monthly updates. We have an update in rotation from cabinet members. Uh, and today it is Julie Isles' turn. Julie as, is the uh, cabinet member for all age learning. So over to you, Julie. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lady. Um, I'm delighted to provide an update to Cabinet. Although my last was as recently as May, this has been a very clearly busy, challenging time across all aspects of our education services and our support for learners of all ages. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank not only our dedicated team of officers within and across all of our directorate, but also the leadership teams, teachers and support staff at all of our schools and colleges. The work has been relentless and I think it's really important that we recognise just how much they have all gone over and above in their efforts to make sure that children and young people in our county have been supported through this response to the COVID-19 situation. Members will have read the report, but for those listening in, I thought I'd just pull out the highlights. We start with the capital investment to deliver special specialist places for our, um, special education needs and disabilities pupils, and that is progressing well. The remaining 108 places in phase one will be delivered from September 2021, and the second phase approved by Cabinet in September of this year will create a further 213 additional places across Surrey's uh, special needs estate in the academic year from September 2021. This speaks to our 2030 vision of no one left behind and our young people with special education needs and disabilities can be educated in the most appropriate setting, closer to home, more engaged in their communities and with reduced travel times which also furthers our future green agenda. If I turn to attendance at school, it has been largely in line with the previous year, and that compares well with national data. The majority of schools have remained open throughout, although there has been an occasional need to respond to public health advice to isolate bubbles within schools. As you might expect, the position changes daily, and schools is supported by our health protection teams and Surrey County Council offices in education and public health. Our local resilience forum are working on arrangements to pilot lateral flow testing and we've put teaching staff high on the priority list for access. I'll also take this opportunity to say that we're examining the detail of the recently announced winter funding package and we're working with school leaders to make sure that children and the relevant families are supported in the most effective way so that they do not go without food or indeed heat in the holidays. Colleagues will see that work is underway to complete the urgent remedial works required to bring our pupil referral units up to standard. And we have just recently closed a consultation which will feed into the planning for the next phase and the wider co-production of our model for the alternative provision. Currently, our per pupil cost exceeds the Department of Education estimates. And we need a step change to achieve the best possible outcomes for young people who access alternative provision. We're not just taking input from each of the phase leads, we're actively engaging with children and young people through our user voice participation networks. As with our special needs pupils, wherever possible, we want local in-school solutions so that learners can remain in mainstream settings closer to home with minimal disruption to their education. My update provides further information about the Learner Spa, that's the Learner's Single Point of Access, which was launched in July. And I'm sure we all welcome this simplified and more timely approach to support families and professionals when there is a concern about the development or the learning needs of the child. The split seems to be two thirds of calls coming from parents and carers and the other third from education settings and professionals. Most calls are resolved at that first point of contact, but because the staffing is by multidisciplinary teams, complex queries can be more easily and quickly supported and addressed. With all requests for education healthcare plans now being reviewed through the Learner Spa, 
we can track and monitor, which will give us better analysis of trends and themes by age group, by primary need, by geography and or by school. Our adult learning teams have continued to provide family and supported learning alongside outreach to disadvantaged residents and those with mild or moderate mental health disabil disabilities since the start of lockdown. There's been a blended learning program with a mix of online and face-to-face -face learning, and we're ensuring delivering this autumn within the COVID safety guidelines. I've included some information about our apprenticeships program because our adult and community education provision will continue to develop the availability of apprenticeships and training courses. And we'll be working with the Economic Recovery Group to look at provision which will address the skills gap and enable those who've recently lost their jobs to study for qualifications which will increase their employability. So thank you for the opportunity to update you on this work across this portfolio leader. And thank you very much, Judy, for um, the, all of your hard work and the officers in, in moving all of these things forward. Um, Mary Lewis. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit about the launch of the learners single point of access from the point of view of families. Uh, Julie Arles and I meet regularly with representatives of Family Voice, who are official family partner. And uh, they've told us over a number of years how difficult it is for families to know how to get help, particularly with complex problems that cross service boundaries. And I note that in the first three months uh, of the nearly 3,000 calls that were taken by the learner SPA, single point of access, 65% of these were from parents, which indicates just how um, how much they, they needed and, and would use such a service. So it, it made me think back to last December when uh, Benedict Simpock, Simcox, the chair of Family Voice, um, joined the scrutiny committee members on a, a trip to the children's single point of access in Guildford, as it was at the time. And her one question to the scrutiny committee was, when can we send parents have one of these single points of access? So uh, she was told then that plans were in place and it was described, but seeing is believing. And uh, since that time, since last December, so in a year, uh, a new location has been set up where the uh, children's single point of access for social care and the learners single point of access can be co-located. The learners bar had its soft opening in the summer and then went from full pelt from September. So I think it's just a fantastic indication of where we're delivering on our promises to families. And it's this sort of thing is so vital in raising the credibility of the council as a provider of really high quality care for children, young people and families. And it is a really important example of what we can do when we work across different parts of the organisation. So I just want to thank all the officers involved, both from the children's social care side in the CSPA and on the education side, Julie's side of matters in the ELSPA. And it's going to be a, a really good um, support to families. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Completely agree, Mary. Thank you very much. And um, Denise, Tennis Stewart. Thank you, Leader. Um, I also wanted to commend Julie and all of the education officers on, on the sheer brevity of this report. I mean, this just really is testament to not just the long held commitments that we have to creating more SEND places and the um, people referral unit capital investment to bring our establishments up to standard. But it's just the business as usual, keeping our schools open, uh, the learning support, providing that outreach to, um, to disadvantaged people and actually the mental health support that can be given through our adult learning and, and stimulation out in our communities. That, that All of this has been maintained throughout such a challenging period. And Julie, you used the term relentless. And I've heard that um, mentioned before on, the, on, the, on the, how it's been for, for you and your team. And I just think that you really need to take credit. And actually the, the apprentice scheme as well for the Fire and Rescue Service, a really great entry point for our young people into or one of our um, very popular public facing services. So I think you deserve huge, huge thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. OK, I can't see any other hands up. So thank you very much for that, Julie. That's, um, yeah, that, that's really, really encouraging. Um, so we'll move on to the next item, um, which um, item uh, eight. 
which is the delegated and urgent decisions. Uh, there was only one, and that related to the second tranche of the infection control fund. Um, that uh, the cheque is in the post, apparently from the government, but uh, it's 15.8 million, of which uh, 9.8 million will go to care homes, 2.8 will go to community care providers, uh, and then 3.2 will uh, be used on a discretionary basis for. Uh, daycare providers and, um, and some uh, support to housing um, uh, organisations and so on. So the full detail of that is set out uh, in the report and the recommendation is that uh, Cabinet notes uh, the decision taken by officers, uh, which I assume um, is agreed unless I see to the contrary. Um, item nine then um, is uh, we've reinstated the COVID-19 update um, it's very brief. Um, quite honestly, by the time most of these reports on COVID are uh, released, uh, the rules have changed uh, and, and they will do again on Thursday. I think, though, there are a couple of bits I'd just like to flag up, um, particularly in relation to test and trace programmes. So uh, as from the 26th of November, um, we will be supplementing the national test and trace programme with our own local test and trace uh, run through our customer services team uh, with public health staff. Um, just standing that up has, uh, has not been an insignificant uh, task, but that's now uh, ready to go, which is good news. Um, uh, the, uh, then the COVID Champions uh, initiative is being implemented. Uh, there's been uh, good um, communication and engagement with the district and boroughs around their part uh, in all of this. Um, at, you know, and particularly the monitoring of, of numbers and uh, uh, the rollout of um, sort of increased communications to residents where those numbers are uh, rising, um, and also the, the, the Marshall schemes uh, and so on. So I think that that uh, you know we are as well prepared uh, as we can be. Um, there was in the first uh, lockdown period uh, uh, between you know, nearly forty thousand. Uh, vulnerable residents that were identified. Um, uh, that that number now, the, the the definition of a vulnerable resident has um, uh, been changed, and, and and they're now described as clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, uh, and of, of those, there are about three and a half thousand, about ten percent or so, uh, uh, and those will be receiving have, are receiving um, outbound calls to make sure that uh, any requirements, any needs that they have, uh, are, are being uh, supported. And then the last point just to note is that the government announced 170 million of funding, winter funding, uh, of which our share is a couple of million or so. That money will be used in part uh, to support free school meals um, during the Christmas holidays. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that, that, uh, that will be rolled out again with the support of the district and boroughs and the schools uh, and where appropriate um, uh, local food banks. Uh, so the uh there are rec there are four uh, recommendations um on that report um which i won't uh, read out um they they're all all um, self evident straightforward as to say i i think we'll have a completely new set of rules probably uh, in the, the coming days anyhow but at least that gives a, a summary of uh, of what we've been doing um to uh, you know to support residents through covid um, so I assume those are agreed. So and then moving on. To, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Zoe. Um, then we're now to the, the first uh, other substantive item, which is um, the draft budget for 21-22 uh, and also then the revised medium term financial strategy at a time when there is so much uncertainty uh, that uh, it is very difficult to uh, to project or predict uh, what that future might look like. But Mel Few is going to try and do exactly that. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Nita. Um, I'm pleased to present the draft budget, which I believe at the moment is realistic, deliverable, and continues the significant progress in stabilising the county's financial position, which, been, which has been achieved through the transformation work started three long years ago. When the final settlement is announced by the government between now and Christmas, the draft budget will be adjusted to reflect that settlement. 
Apart from adult social care, where those authorities with responsibility for providing care to the elderly might be required by government to raise an additional precept cover to co- uh, precept to cover the growing demand, it is not anticipated that any individual services will be impacted by the funding announcement. Before going into the details of the budget pack, I would like to make the following points. This draft follows months of hard work which has steadily reduced the gap, which started at some £64 million and now is at its current level of £18.3 million. Work to close the gap still remains to be completed before it is presented to full council in February 2021. This paper not only contains the detailed service budgets and their respective pressures, but also the refreshed organisation strategy, which now addresses the changing strategic context in which the council finds itself operating due to the impact on its way of working brought about through the COVID-19 pandemic. The refreshed organization strategy does not change, but reconfirms the vision 2030 and is now aligned to four priority objectives. Growing the sustainable economy, tackling health inequality, enabling a greener future and empowering communities. The Cabinet will also find the paper outlines a summary of the refreshed transformation program, which has been aligned to the four priority objectives. As for the past two years, this budget has been set on three main principles. No use of reserves to balance the budget. Realistic, detailed efficiency measures identified by service. Each service having its own budget envelope and is expected to deliver the services to the front line while remaining within those limits. That said, it should be recognised that continuing challenges exist going forward. In meeting the ever-rising demand of both adults and children's services, and of course, we must also be aware of the yet unknown impact of round two of COVID and its potential, which could have negative effects on the council finances through the year 2021. Despite the impact of COVID-19 this year, I believe the county finances are in significantly better position than two years ago. And we are in the fortunate position of having being able to increase our reserves. And we'll most likely at the end of this financial year, with another outturn balanced without using any reserves, be in a position to further increase those reserve balances. Turning to the details of the budget, firstly, I will deal with the revenue. For 2021, the proposed revenue budget has been set at 971.6 million and is based on the following assumptions. A council tax rise of 1.99%, which you expect to yield in the region of about 780 million. We estimate that business rates will remain stable with no major changes, envisaged and has been set at 116.4 million per the current year. Although the current year's collection fund incorporating both business rates and council tax from the boroughs is currently in line with expectations, there is growing realisation that the boroughs will not be able to collect the full amounts due to the council council this year. Current estimates for the shortfall after the first half of the year is £32 million for council tax and £5 million for business rates, a total of £37 million. The government have acknowledged this problem and will promulgate the county authorities must or or amortise the shortfall of collections from boroughs and districts over three years. Accordingly, an amount of 10.8 million in respect to the council tax and 1.7 million for business rates in the budget has been included. Government grants projected at 93.4, we see no major changes in that area. As I said before, no adult social care precept of equivalent to 2% in prior years, is foreseen for the budget year. The details of the main element of funding are set out in Table 3 in paragraphs 5.23 of the paper. On the national and local funding context, uh, sorry, the national and local funding context is outlined in paragraphs 5.12 through to 5.43, where the main point to note is that the promised comprehensive spending review by the government is of today not has not materialised, despite the numerous indications that it would be imminently available, which then leaves the county and local authorities to rely on an annual settlement. Expenditure. 
The budgeted service envelopes are set out in Table 2 and totaled 989.3 million, as I said, leaving, uh, as I said earlier, leaving a gap of 18.3 million. There, are, there is still work to go undergoing to identify the efficiencies on the following services. With adult social care, the gap is 5 million at this point. Children's, families and lifelong learning and culture is 5.9 million. And environment and transport and infrastructure, 5.9 million. I'm confident that with a little bit more hard work and sharper pencils, these gaps could be closed. The individual service strategies and narratives are detailed in paragraphs 4 through to 4.45. Cabinet should also note the comment in paragraph 5.44 where the emerging SIPFA Financial Management Code of Practice paper will become effective in the new budget year. The final version of this budget, budget report will set out the Council's finding in detail and also detail any actions required to ensure compliance with this new Code of Practice. If I turn to the capital expenditure budget from paragraph 6.1 in the papers, this is the most exciting element of the budget, being the highest and most defined capital budget that I've seen in the last three years. Over the next five years, the proposed capital spend of 1.7 billion has been established in line with the county's top four priorities. For example, ensuring our school facilities are kept to high standards, investing in tackling climate change, including flood alleviation schemes throughout the county, looking after adults in our care throughout through major program in provision of extra care homes, with the most innovative item being the introduction of Your Fund Surrey, a five-year capital fund whose objective is empowering communities to fund placemaking or place improvements within their communities. The program is currently being advertised to residents and will be officially launched in February 2021. A summary of the capital program over the five years is set out in Table 4, with the annual budget for 2021 set at 199 million, and the top 10 projects for next year are set out in paragraph 6.20. As is normal practice, the budget contains the medium-term financial outlook for 2025 to 2026. The current uncertainty with regards to funding of local authorities remains one of the biggest items to be resolved going forward. The service budgets have been assessed as to likely demand and inflation pressures, balanced against the revenue projectors and efficiencies driven through further transformation programs. The results of these projections are set out in Tables 8 and 9 and reflect the budget gaps likely to occur going forward, which provisionally total £170 million pounds over the period. The next steps in this budget setting process are for the security, uh, scrutiny committees to review the individual budgets with any recommendations being made to Cabinet by mid-December. Once these comments have been addressed and the financial settlement received from government built into the budget, it will be presented for adoption by full council at its annual budget meeting in February 21. In closing, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the officers, but especially our diligent and determined finance team for all the hours of work that have gone into bringing the budget to this stage. There are three recommendations for the cabinet. One is to note the budget the draft budget and the medium term financial outlook. Two, to note the provisional budget gap of 18.3 million, which will be reduced to zero in due course. And to note the proposed capital budget program for 2025-2026 of 1.7 billion. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Mal, and, and uh, thank you to you um, and to Becky, who I, I think is going to say a few words now for uh, all of your hard work in uh, in getting us to uh, this point. Um, Becky, do you want to add something? Thank you. Yes. Mel, this is a very positive step towards delivering a balanced budget for the financial year 21-22. And it is the accumulation of a lot of hard work, both by the finance community and the service directorates. Of course, this draft budget is built on what is now a stable and robust financial position for the current financial year. As we heard at Cabinet earlier in the year, as the Finance Improvement Programme was closed, the financial position of Surrey County Council has transformed thanks to solid leadership from yourself as Cabinet member and from Lee Whitehouse and his, his, his award-winning finance team. Robust financial processes 
and by embedding finance into the decision-making processes within the services. Finance is an enabler of the County Council. Good financial management enables good financial decisions to be made, which in turn provides better services for our residents. Many residents will have seen the Your Fund Surrey Community Project Scheme launched last week that Mel and the leader also mentioned today. This is the extremely exciting 100 million fund for legacy projects within our communities and part of an overall 1.7 billion capital programme over the next five years. This capital programme is another example of Surrey County Council's robust financial position, acting as an enabler for the council to further invest in its infrastructure and assets used to deliver services to residents. Capital investment is critical for the County Council. It enables us to enhance and improve our infrastructure and assets, and also enables us to transform the way we deliver services, better outcomes for residents, reducing future revenue pressures, and helping um, us um, find money for um, frontline services. Last year, Surrey County Council benchmarked the associated cost of borrowing for capital programmes against other authorities. Surrey County Council ratio of current financing cost net revenue budget is low at 2.6% and forecast to remain low at 6.5% despite the 1.4 billion approved um, plan spend. Similar authorities have a ratio of 6.5%. The capital spend is considered prudent and falls within our current borrowing limits. This exciting and ambitious five-year programme brings us more in line and enables the council to, to drive forward its four priority areas. Thank you, Mel and Lee, for your financial leadership. And thank you to all of finance and the directorates for getting their draft budget in such good shape. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, it, uh, and it's a, a, a testament to the hard work and the difficult decisions that have been taken over the last two or three years. You know that, that we are able to say that um, the council is in uh, good financial financial shape, uh, and you know there are many projects now where we are uh, able to uh, invest uh, for the future. And then we should we shouldn't take it for granted that, that balancing the budget is you know is a given. Um, you know local government um, has has absolutely stepped up to the plate uh, during COVID, uh, and you know we have had to. To manage the, the 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 normal the business as usual services as well as uh, responding to uh, the pandemic, and to do that uh, and to uh, retain our sort of financial robustness is is uh, you know is is, is impressive. Um, I wish that uh, the government, uh, you know, and I've said this uh, every time I've commented on um, budgets, uh, local government, I, I wish the government could give us longer term security. If we if we had a three year projection in terms of what our funding would look like, that would enable us to take some longer term uh, decisions. But uh, sadly, that isn't the case. We nearly got there this year, but at the last minute, um, uh, the, the government had decided to do a one year spending review. Uh, and I suspect that's probably how it will remain. But uh, anyway, I think in, in the context of that uncertainty, uh, this is a, a very good, I think, budget. Um, you know, we'll go through the scrutiny process uh, and all members will have an opportunity to, to comment. Uh, and then uh, once we have the settlement um, just before Christmas, uh, we can then uh, uh, present this to uh, council in February. But uh, I think there's uh, I think it reassures I hope it reassures residents uh, that, that we are using their money wisely. Uh, and that, you know, wherever possible, we're uh, maintaining and enhancing uh, the services that they access uh, and uh, benefit from. So uh, thank you, um, Mel, Lee uh, and Becky uh, and uh, uh, Rachel and Anna in particular for uh, for this report uh, and um, for getting our finances uh, into a good shape. Um, as Mel says, there are um, three recommendations. Um, I won't reread those. Um, are those agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. OK, so the next item then um, is to do with ultra low and zero emission buses. Um, over to you, Matt. Thank you, Leader. So. 
This item here today is about uh, a significant investment into ultra low or zero emission buses, as well as community transport vehicles. Uh, we are very much wanting to accelerate the introduction of ultra low and zero emission vehicles in Surrey. And to do so, we are establishing a zero emission, ultra low emission scheme backed by the County Council to generate support funding for the industry investment. This very much supports our ambitions uh, for a greener future, Surrey 2030 vision and our climate change strategy and is part of the Council's response to the declared climate emergency and our £300 million investment into greener futures. By providing these sustainable transport options, we will contribute to a reduction in the harmful emissions and towards zero net, net zero carbon. Uh, as mentioned before, 46% of all our carbon emissions are transport related in Surrey. So by establishing this scheme, we will accelerate uh, the introduction of ultra low and zero emission buses and minibuses into Surrey. But also this project and this investment uh, does encompass bus priority measures and pinch points on the highway, uh, as well as real time information for passengers to aid knowledge and travel decision making. Um, and also complementary investment by the bus operators and community transport providers. So the proposed financial support from the council um, is an introduction investment of about 70 to 80 uh, ultra low or zero emission buses and an additional 50 community transport minibuses over the next five years. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before with the, the question, uh, we do believe this is the first occasion that such a scheme of such magnitude will be introduced in one area of the UK. And we have been working closely with all of our partners on this, and they are extremely excited about the opportunity uh, to deliver uh, such a large scale change. So the companies and organisations which receive the new buses uh, will be able to cascade the less polluting diesel bus models. These are the Euro 5 and 6 emission rating ones, uh, they're the latest ones, replaced by the scheme onto other routes around the county. And this means that we can get the more polluting lower Euro engine ratings 3 and 4 um, off uh, the roads of Surrey. Um, it will depend, of course, on which bids and where in, in the county, uh, but I'm pleased to say that we will be prioritising areas with declared uh, air quality management areas uh, to get uh, the funding. The technology that we're likely to include will be hydrogen, full electric or uh, extended range battery driven electric buses, uh, micro hybrid extended range electric buses, and uh, electric motor uh, that powers buses at all times with uh, GPS geofencing, uh, which sure shuts the diesel uh, engines down uh, when it enters AQMAs. So the bus element of this scheme um, is 32.3 million of capital funding, and this will accelerate the introduction of the buses starting in the next 12 months. Uh, there will be an additional nine million pounds, which will go into bus priority measures and this will be targeted at the pinch points identified by both the council and the bus operators, which form part of this scheme. Uh, this is very much a complementary investment, which will allow the buses to operate more efficiently and run to the published timetable, ensuring that the council can secure the most effective use of these new buses. Uh, we will also um, be uh, prioritising and updating uh, our priority studies for the buses. An example of which will be the Red Hill Rygate Bus Priority Study, which has already been commissioned. Uh, this is considering opportunities on the A23 between Red Hill and Hawley, uh, including bus lanes, uh, intelligent bus priority traffic signals, and it is also being developed to improve the traffic flow at the A23 Three Arch uh, Road Junction near the East Surrey Hospital. We'll also be putting in uh, 1.4 million uh, alongside uh, £100,000 of revenue funding uh, for the real-time passenger information systems. Uh, this makes journeys more sustainable and uh, supports resilient and better connected communities, allowing people to access uh, on-street information displays and uh, data as it's happening. And then not to mention how sort of uh, the community transport element. This is a very important area. We are already doing uh, and put a bid in to the demand responsive transport service uh, to the DFT about getting more rural areas uh, involved. It's not a one size fits all for all transport. And by actually extending this into the community transport sector and providing 50 new ultra low or zero emission vehicles across Surrey, 
uh, we're able to support our residents who cannot access the mainstream public transports or buses and trains uh, to access many of the key services such as healthcare. So it is all very much connected uh, together. Uh, we put an expression of interest into the DFT for just over half a million pounds. And should this be successful, uh, we will be able to get a more comprehensive uh, four vehicle operation to be provided uh, across Surrey. So, Leader, this is extremely exciting. We've got our partners uh, very much on board here and ready to deliver. Uh, and it is at all levels of um, uh, bus operator, right down to the community, um, as well as uh, our key large playing operators across Surrey. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I've got um, two speakers. I also have a note, um, Mike Goodman, that you would like to speak. Is that right? Yes, please, Leader. Yeah, so as, as I know you're a huge supporter of this uh, when you were in the Cabinet, so do you want to go first? Yes, please, thank you. It is just over a year ago since Surrey County Council were the first County Council to announce their intention of moving all buses operating in Surrey to ultra-low emissions by 2030 as part of their overall strategy of net zero by 2050. At the time, this was a bold and exciting announcement. And today, I would like to congratulate Matt Furness and the officer team who have developed this initiative over the last year. And today's paper is a significant step forward in delivering actions to deliver this strategy. Now, at a time when finances are tight, together with the COVID, effect of COVID, this council is prioritising and proposing making a fund of 49 million available, of which 39 million will be to support grants for buses and 3.6 million, as Matt said, for community transport, to enable them to purchase electric hydrogen buses and other ultra low emission buses. This is an exciting and forward thinking project and demonstrates that Surrey are without doubt leading the way in tackling climate change with this projected um, project, reducing emissions and improving air quality. The paper says one of the priorities will be those areas with poor quality, air quality, which is great news for those residents affected, and I welcome this. Interestingly, the paper before Cabinet today comes just one week after the government's announcement of a 10-point green industrial revolution plan. The plan includes some particularly ambitious commitments, such as 2030 phase-out dates for the sale of diesel and, and petrol cars, and has set a clear trajectory across a range of key sectors for net zero, including offshore wind, nuclear power and hydrogen. The package in total will be 20 million of investment. The government plan will create jobs. And I hope Surrey will be at the front of these new op job opportunities in the green economy. The drive to support hydrogen buses will be great news for our rural areas where electric batteries may not have the range. Now, green hydrogen plants are being developed in the southeast, with hydrogen being an important element of Surrey's transport. We are well placed to work with the industry in Surrey and potentially create jobs. This project today is an important step forward and demonstrates that Surrey are leading the way in tackling climate change. The commitment of this cabinet is clear and, in my opinion, is unrivaled by any other council. This is a great opportunity for bus companies and community groups to work with Surrey County Council in increasing the fleet of low, ultra low emission vehicles in Surrey and at the same time improve the quality of the air residence brief. Leader, this is an excellent and forward thinking project and I fully support it and I thank Matt for bringing it to Cabinet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. That's, uh, excellent. Um, OK, we have some more speakers. So, uh, Natalie Bramble. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Uh, uh, Councillor Goodman has has said some of the things I was going to say, so I'll cut my, my uh, speech down slightly. I, too, am really pleased to support this paper from, from uh, Councillor Furness. Um, as we know, Surrey's roads carry twice as much traffic than the average for the southeast, and it's vital at Surrey that we increase the usage of public transport and at the same time reduce our transport emissions so we can meet our goal of being net zero by 2050. The environmental outcomes of moving from older diesel vehicles to ultra low or zero emission vehicles will help considerably in improving our local air quality. 
and hydrogen buses coming to Rygate and Redhill is incredibly exciting and a massive step forward for our county. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Sinead. Thank you, Lida. I'm really happy to support this paper. It is very clear that there is so much work going on to accelerate the introduction of ultra low and zero emission vehicles into Surrey. But as a divisional member for Staines in Spelthorne, I am so pleased to note that Transport for London has announced a new contract for the 290. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the 290 uh, goes from Twickenham to Staines. And TfL will be using seven new electric single deck buses. Whilst this isn't a Surrey County Council scheme, it certainly does contribute to us delivering our ambitions. Matt, I'd like to ask you if you agree that developing innovative integrated transport delivery options with our partners is critical to the success of our schemes and what focus is being placed on developing those strong links. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, Matt, do you want to hold off answering that until we we do the next two speakers and then pick it all up at the same time, if that's OK. Uh, Denise Turner-Stewart. Thank you, Leader. Um, I would just like to commend the holistic approach that's been taken with this paper. I mean, it's absolutely looking at all the solutions needed to incentivise more of our residents and visitors to use our public transport, particularly real-time information and the prioritisation through pinch points, which we all know is a frustration for people that sometimes use public transport, but particularly um, representing an area which has always had exceedances and has always been an air quality management area, as the whole borough of Spelthorne is. To have this commitment and prioritisation around the funding to these areas is the first sort of tangible and deliverable um, mechanism to actually start to bring the um, the emissions and the, and the pollution levels down. So it's it's fantastic to see um, as I say, the range of, of, of actions and mitigations within this report to improve our air quality and to um, improve our public transport. So thank you. Thank you, Denise. Mary Lewis. Thank you, Leader. Uh, as colleagues will know, it doesn't take much to get me excited about buses and uh, community transport, but this is no little thing because we're talking about 50 community transport vehicles over the next five years. We're talking about a lot of buses as well, um, contributing to the green agenda. Um, the reason for my excitement is that as the co-founder with my residents and as deputy chairman of the Cobham Chatterbus, um, we can see all the opportunities for uh, alleviating transport poverty that come from having good community services running on local routes that people really want to use. At the moment, of course, the pandemic is, is stalling things in the development of public transport and bus networks. But the pandemic has changed behaviour in ways that I think will be positive for our community transport and local buses in the future. People are tending to shop locally. They're tending to um, use leisure facilities locally, to walk locally and you know go for a walk, maybe starting with the bus and going somewhere pleasant. And I think if we can enable more and more of our residents to have access to all these things that car users have traditionally taken for granted, as well as reducing the usage of cars amongst car owners, uh, we will be really pushing forward uh, a greener Surrey and delivering on our no one left behind agenda. I've seen for myself how real time passenger information can make a big difference to usage of, uh, of buses. And um, so I'd put in a quick word with the cabinet member now for um, an extra bit of uh, real time passenger information on the other side of my high street, please. I think this is a thoroughly good report and uh, I'm really pleased to, to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Matt, back to you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, yes, no, thank you everyone for your support. Um, we, we do work very closely with um, all of our partners. Um, the bus operators were, were very quick to thank us, uh, particularly during the pandemic, because we, uh, we said from day one that we would continue our payments. We've been working very closely with them to deliver as many of the services as we possibly can. Um, and even just here on this paper and uh, our bids to the DFT, uh, they do support us quite heavily uh, in getting the, these funding uh, streams together. So uh, just on, on Sinead, just on, on your point, um, we are working closely with the operators. The partnerships are absolutely key. And if you, if you look at um, point eight on uh, page 107, 
there is a line in there which is is, is just in the paragraph it's uh the project will also support the enhanced working with the bus industry through quality bus partnerships and uh, this this enables the operators not only through bidding for the funding but it also says what they're going to put back in as well so it's not just a one side funding uh, the operators have made it very clear that uh, our support now means that they are able to support us back with uh, accelerating more buses and uh, more investment into the network uh, in the future as things hopefully start returning uh, to a, a bit of normality over the coming years. So, uh, Leader, I, I think this is really exciting. Uh, Councillor Goodman started things off with the world, the UK's first uh, electric park and ride. And let's hope we can make uh, the rest of Surrey uh, fully electric or hydrogen going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, uh, Mike, I know, was, was, you know, was a keen advocate of this and pushed it forward during his time in the Cabinet and, and you've taken it on to the next stage. This is, is a, a really good next step. I mean, I think it's absolutely essential that we build um, and facilitate a, a good public transport infrastructure. Uh, you know, if we're ever going to get anywhere near to hitting um, our targets, we do need to attack that 46% of carbon emissions from uh, transport uh, and you know if we've got only when we've got a, a kind of reliable uh, uh, you know, transport system uh, with real-time data uh, will people be confident to use it to go to the train station or wherever it is uh, that they want to go to so this is a really good step forward um, there are two recommendations the first is to support the establishment of the scheme uh, and the second is to uh, leave the detail of the implementation uh, to the cabinet member and executive directors. Um, can I assume that um, is agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. OK, we'll move on then to uh, item 12, which is um, uh, just introducing really the, the, co the community impact assessment report that I touched on at the beginning. Uh, th this is a, a set of reports, um, both across the county and broken down. Uh, by district and borough that explore the kind of the health, the social and the economic impacts of COVID um, and uh, is intended to be used uh, to provide uh, targeted support uh, to the communities uh, that, that, that need it, you know, to um, to enable us to act um, to prevent or to mitigate uh, some of those uh, future impacts uh, and to understand the experience of residents um, so that we can uh, improve um, how we deliver our services wherever possible. Um, th that uh, that that has that 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 this piece of work has already fed into the four priorities that, that both I and Mel um, have have talked about around the economy, greener future, health inequalities in our communities. So it, it's been uh, really helpful in that sense. Uh, the report that we've had from Surrey University on the general. A state of the economy in Surrey uh, also feeds into that. So I think we've got some really good quality data now um, where we can uh, start to look at how we can support uh, those those um, parts of our community where it's had a disproportionate impact. And we know that that, uh, uh, that you know residents from a, a BAME background, uh, those that have experienced um, very sadly domestic abuse. Uh, those with mental health um, conditions uh, and those actually people living in residential care have been disproportionately affected uh, and we need to we need to do something uh, about that. So the, the four key priority areas, uh, I, I believe, do pick up those issues uh, and uh, we'll start to address it, just not just us, but also with our partners. So uh, I, I would um, encourage you to uh, familiarise yourself with uh, the report and the findings and I know that we're the officers are spending time with our district and borough colleagues and, and other partners to make sure that they're uh, you know fully cognizant with uh, with, the, with with what that, those uh, that report says uh, and that would help us build a collective response um, I, I'm not going to um, go into any more detail at this stage uh, unless anybody has any questions but it's a piece of work um, that uh, you know will, will well, we will keep updated. I mean, this isn't just a one-off report. This is this is something that we will use continually. Go out and test in our communities um, what uh, what what is happening. There is one uh, error on paragraph seven um, of the report uh, where it talks about uh, the the partner organisations that we have worked with, 
uh, and uh, towards the end of that paragraph, it talks about Surrey voluntary action. Uh, in fact, that, of course, should be Surrey community action. Um, so we apologise to Jason uh, and his team for uh, that uh, slight inaccuracy. Um, other than that, um, there are three recommendations. That is to note the findings, uh, is to consider how the findings um, of the report can be incorporated into the Council's uh, planning, and I think we, we have already uh, started to do that, um, uh, and it highlights areas uh, that we need to look at um, in, in the future and areas for uh, future research. Um, so um, I will take it that those, uh, those three recommendations um, are agreed, unless I see any hands to the contrary. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, item 13 then uh, is uh, a report on the transformation of accommodation based care um, and delivering independent living options. Um, Sinead Mooney. Thank you, Leader. I feel very strongly that this paper is great news for Surrey County Council and even better news for our working age adults with vulnerabilities. I'm so pleased to be announcing our launch of the delivery of 500 independent living schemes for our most vulnerable residents. Much progress has been made through a combination of external partnerships, best use of our, best use of our VOI properties and other initi initiatives as, as set out on page 168 of this paper. But this paper is really about identifying sites and Surrey's ownership to create independent living schemes ensuring that our working age vulnerable residents have choices, independence, a home for life, and become an active and integral part of where they live. In essence, this paper is a great example of our commitment to empowering communities. For too long, some may say, this council has spoken in lofty tones about the need to build more housing, but this paper is all about delivery and is in the next steps towards fulfilling our ambitious accommodation with care and support strategy, with a renewed focus on independent living as a way of empowering and enabling adults with learning disabilities or autism to live fulfilling and independent lives and removing the barriers and ways of old that have so often prevented this. The contents of this paper is something we should all be very proud of. In the summer in 2019, I met a young woman with a learning disability who wanted to show me a new home. It was a one bedroom independent living scheme. I cannot tell you how excited she was when she took me to her home and how pr and the pride she had when she showed me her brand new tabletop dishwasher. As she showed me how to load the dishwasher and switch it on, at the same time, she spoke me through the process she followed to pay her rent. And I was really struck by the tangible happiness that she exuded and that came from being able to make the decisions necessary for her to live her best life. And I want all people who need our services and support to have the freedom that this young woman enjoys. So with this in mind, I very much welcome my Cabinet colleagues' support for this report, as per the recommendations set out on pages 165 and 166 of the Agenda Pack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, Alison Griffiths. Yeah. And thank you, for Sinead, for a very touching introduction. Um, I very much welcome this paper, and I would like to thank you, Councillor Mooney, and all of the officers who have worked so hard on this proposal. As referenced in this paper, evidence, oops, evidence suggests individuals living independently with support have better experiences and outcomes than those living in residential care. Our residents will have an increased choice with accommodation options available to meet their care needs and related to their disability, enabling our more vulnerable residents to make the right decisions for themselves. This accommodation will be placed at the heart of our communities where possible, helping to reduce social isolation and loneliness through social inclusion opportunities, workplace opportunities and much more, ensuring residents' health and wellbeing is greatly improved through such schemes. This programme will truly transform our residents with learning disabilities and autism's lives, providing service users real options, real choices and real support, enabling this cohort of residents to reach their full potential. 
everyone deserves to be empowered to make decisions regarding their own lives and how we choose to live it. I'm so thankful that this opportunity will provide just that for many of our residents in Surrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, Mary Lewis. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, like Alison Griffiths, I was very touched by Sinead's um, introduction, her story. Um, and that's because I had the opposite kind of visit a few years ago when I first became a member um, to a learning disabilities facility in my division. And it was very much in the old style. I don't mean it was a long stay hospital. I haven't been a member that long, but we hadn't moved far forward. Very small bedrooms were the only personal space that uh, the people, the adults living in this uh, residential uh, care home had. And uh, they didn't have their own bathrooms and they were expected to leave quite an institutional life. And I think the dignity that comes from providing a, a more independent style of accommodation, as is proposed in this report, can't be underestimated. I think it's a, a fantastic move forward into the 21st century for Surrey County Council. And while speaking, Leader, I, I'd just like to advise you that uh, Sinead Mooney has lost her connection. She's been contacting me on my phone, sending me a, a, a text saying that I'm afraid she's not in the meeting any further to continue with her report. But I think that uh, just like me, many other members will be delighted to support it in her absence because it is such a, a great change for the council. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mary. Uh, right, well, we'll see if she joins us before uh, we get to recommendations, but we can we can uh, we can take those anyway. Um, yeah, Denise. Thank you, Leader. Again, I would like to echo my uh, my colleague's sentiments. Um, things that we take um, take for granted, choice and control and independence in our lives is being extended to to our um, residents who are deserving of their opportunities to have their home for life. And it's fantastic that we are delivering yet again on this bold ambition to deliver a 40 to 50 percent of provision within five years. So I'm just absolutely delighted to see um, such fantastic um, commitment to this and um, the fact that it's evidence based. It's, it's in um, extensive consultation with families and, and all of the stakeholders. Um, I absolutely commend this report. So thank you to the team. Thank you, uh, Denise. Um, OK, well, I can't. Um, Sinead has had a power cut, so um, OK, well, uh, I think there weren't. Uh, I think there were more statements and questions to her. So I think she, she'd um, given a, a full uh, explanation of the report. So uh, in her absence, I'll propose uh, the two uh, that we we adopt the two recommendations and I'll read those for you. So the first recommendation um, is to approve the approach to delivering the published strategic aim of increasing the proportion of working age adults with support needs uh, living in supported independent living settings. And the second recommendation is that we give in principle approval for the sites disclosed in part two of this paper to be used to deliver new supported independent living accommodation. Uh, business cases will be presented to Cabinet to confirm final approval for the development of these sites for independent living. So uh, in Sinead's absence, but on her behalf, um, can you confirm everybody please that you're happy to agree those two recommendations? Agreed. Very happy, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, right, so we will then move on to item 14, which is the revised minerals and waste development scheme. And over to Natalie Bramble. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Members will recall that at the last Cabinet meeting, the Surrey Waste Local Plan was approved. I'm pleased to bring forward to this meeting a programme to update the Minerals and Waste Development Scheme. The scheme was last updated in 2011 and is now very out of date. As you're aware, we now intend to produce a joint Minerals and Waste Local Plan, which will help to reflect the synergies between the two separate policies. We will therefore be reviewing both the Minerals Local Plan and the Surrey Waste Local Plan to produce the joint plan. The Surrey Waste Local Plan is due to be adopted at full council next month 
and would not ordinarily have been reviewed so soon. However, it is appropriate to bring forward a review and produce this joint plan. I'm mindful that in reviewing the plan, members did not feel fully engaged in the previous process, and I will therefore ensure that all members, particularly in the divisions potentially affected, are kept fully informed. With reporting through the Select Committee, member briefings and Cabinet updates, plus a cross-party member reference group, and there will also be full engagement with our boroughs and districts. With the public as well at an issues and options consultation to come forward in June next year. Once complete, the Surrey Minerals Waste and Local Plan will provide certainty for minerals operators, waste management companies, and more importantly, our local residents. Um, thank you, Natalie. Um, I don't see any other any other hands up. I think uh, this is a follow on really from the previous reports and uh, uh, this will come back to uh, cabinets in due course. So thank you very much for that kind of update and clarification. Well, let me just sorry, let me just see if there are what the recommendation is the recommendation is we approve the proposed revised minerals and waste development scheme. October 2020. Um, I'll take that as uh, agreed unless I see any hands to the contrary. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, then item 15, uh, Blackwater Valley Hotspots. Uh, Matt. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, so this is uh, a key priority for Guildford here. Uh, in 2016, uh, Guildford Borough Council secured funding from the Enterprise M3 uh, Economic Partnership uh, to deliver highway improvements to tackle congestion um, as part of their local plan support. Uh, the improvements are proposed for two junctions, the junction with the A31 and A331, and the junction with the A323, uh, A324. Uh, Guildford Borough Council progressed uh, both of these schemes um, to the project I initiation until July of this year. Uh, and in July, uh, Guildford Borough Council asked the County Council to step in and uh, deliver these schemes. Um, this agreement was made on the best known cost estimates at the time. Uh, however, we have done a review um, and uh, found that uh, there was actually a 3.179 million funding shortfall um, in that. So what we've been doing is uh, engaging with uh, Guildford Borough Council and uh, the local enterprise partnership, uh, looking at the figures and as well with our own contractor, Kia. Uh, so since then, we have had an agreement in principle from Guildford Borough Council to increase the level uh, that they're willing to fund. Uh, and we have said that uh, once that's confirmed, we would be happy to cover the rest as the County Council and deliver this uh, strategically important project, uh, which supports the uh, the Guildford local plan. Uh, so, uh, Leader, we've phrased uh, the recommendations, as you can see there. Um, we will need to get a, a final agreement from Guildford Borough Council and the Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, officers and I are holding regular meetings, as I know you have been with um, members of Guildford Borough Council, uh, in order to deliver this. Um, and I would ask that uh, everyone uh, supports the recommendations so that we can deliver this extremely important uh, strategic improvement. Uh, which impacts not only the Guildford Borough, but uh, Waverley uh, and our neighbours in uh, Hampshire as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Yes, I mean, technically, probably we could go a bit further in recommendation two in that where you said that we engage in active conversations. That, that there are active conversations and, and hopefully it's completing those conversations. But I don't think we need to change the recommendation unless you're uh, you know, suggesting otherwise. Um, so uh, we'll go to Julie Isles. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Leader, and thank you, Matt. Um, speaking as a divisional member uh, in the Guildford Borough Council part, I would like to say that the key reason why I welcome Surrey County Council stepping in here is so that our expertise is in play to deliver these schemes. The Guildford Local Plan is very reliant on these and other infrastructure schemes being delivered, and that was made very clear when the plan was taken through at Guildford Borough Council 
Um, so I welcome our engagement. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I can't see any other hands up. Um, there are the four recommendations as per the paper um, and feels as if sounds as if we will get to a, a landing on that um, in, in the near future, which would be good news. So thank you for that. Um, on that basis, um, uh, can I assume that those four recommendations are agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and just to confirm, uh, Sinead is back with us um, after your power cut. So, um, and we approved uh, your item in your absence. Okay. Um, moving on then, item 16, Surrey Schools and Early, early Years Funding. Uh, back to Julia. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, a business as usual paper in that we're required to consult on and maintain local formula arrangements to allocate the direct school grants to our mainstream schools and our early years providers. The paper takes us through the various elements or blocks of funding which make up that direct school grant, um, namely schools, the school central services, the high needs or special education needs and disabilities funding and early years. And the indicative funding for 21-22 um, is summarised, but the final funding allocations will be published in December so that they take account of pupil number changes between October 19 and October of this year. The Department for Education require formal council approval of the local funding formula and Schools Forum is a statutory body which must be consulted on the allocation of the direct schools grant. Whilst it's largely consultative, it does have decision making powers in specific areas, including the transfer of funding from the schools block. The Department of Education is increasing school funding nationally and we should welcome that. It's the second year of three year increase in school funding and minimum per pupil levels are being increased so that it will be £4,180 per primary place and to £5,415 per secondary pupil. I think it's also important that Cabinet note a change in policy from the Department of Education and it no longer allows local authorities to meet overspends on the direct schools grant budgets from the general fund. In Surrey, this affects the high needs block because it has a cumulative and an annual deficit. And this change increases the pressure to reduce the high needs overspend within the direct schools grant. The SEND transformation programme has achieved efficiencies of £8 million in 2021 with the aim of reducing costs while still providing excellent services. We are overdue a national review of funding for that high needs block and Surrey and other local authorities are having to set aside reserves whilst recovery plans bring those SEND budgets back into balance. So it will be very interesting to see if the Chancellor's announcements tomorrow address this in any of the one year funding pledges. As I say, it's been a, a long term um, commitment to review those. The DfE is continuing to face in a, phase in a national funding formula to replace the individual school funding formulae of the 149 different local authorities. And there's a restatement of the intent to move to a hard national funding formula, meaning that there won't be any discretion over formula factors. As in previous years, School Forum have not supported a request to transfer 0.5% of the school's funding block to support pressures in our high needs block. So if we turn to the recommendations on page 259 of the pack, recommendation number one is to lodge an appeal with the Secretary of State to overturn that decision. Forum have agreed recommendations two and three, which is to implement the minimum per pupil level in full and the early years funding. It's set out in Annex 4 and it reflects hourly funding, SEN inclusion and an increase in the funding for free meals provision. And recommendations four and five seek delegated authority on the SEN funding. 
following further consultation with schools in November and with Forum in December. So that's to approve the amendments to the funding rates in the formulae following receipt of the settlement and the DfE pupil data in December. This is to ensure that total allocations to schools under this formula remain affordable within the Council's direct schools grant settlement. So it's a, a quite mathematical paper, but it sets out our statutory responsibilities and um, any delegated decisions when the final data is advanced. Thanks very much, Judy. Um, uh, yes, two, two things just before. Um, uh, so Mark Nutty has now um, been able to join the meeting. Um, and then secondly, there's a question from, we'll come up from Mary Lewis. Thank you, um, Leader. I was just um, going to say that I remember agonising over this um, applying to the Secretary of State for um, the permission to transfer funds. And it isn't something that any of us like to do. We want to work in partnership with our schools. But um, when we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to keep within the budget envelope for SEND and when the amounts involved in the high needs block are so huge, I think we have to keep this option open, however uncomfortable it makes us feel. And, um, and so I do support the uh, Cabinet member in, in this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And, and uh, as Cabinet, we, we have raised this with our members of Parliament. This is a national issue. The funding of SEND is not, not just a local issue. Uh, the the uh, numbers of people accessing the service nationwide has increased exponentially. Uh, and I do think there's something the government need to look at, uh, the, you know, the, the longer term funding for, for SEND. But uh, in the meantime, we're, the, 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 you know, we're, we'll um, consider making the application to the Secretary of State at the same time as raising this issue with him and with the Treasury uh, and uh, uh, and see what happens. Um, as Judy said, there are five recommendations on the paper. Um, can I take that, that those are agreed, please? Agreed. Thank you very much. OK, item 17 then. Um, is an update on the waste PFI contract, um, which is known as the Eco Park at um, Shepparton. Um, many of us have had um, a number of emails from residents, uh, local residents, uh, over the weekend, and thank you very much uh, for those. Um, I'm not going to um, specifically address the points that, that, that has been raised, but I think others will, um, wherever possible on this call, do that. Um, th this paper was simply to uh, just to to um, update residents on, on where we're at. Um, uh, this has become an extremely protracted uh, contract uh, and uh, facility. Um, the the, uh, the, the this, this, the, there is no question that, that that there is frustration on all parts. Uh, there are four parties effectively involved in, in any conversation. That's uh, Suez uh, as the uh, our, our the main contractor, their own contractors, um, ourselves, and, and then DEFRA, who are funding this. Um, and that complicates things where you have all four organisations um, with a view. Having said that, I think we've now got to the point uh, where uh, we... Um, we need to have clear legal advice on what our remedies are and what we can do to bring this contract uh, to a uh, to a conclusion uh, one way or the other. Uh, and that is what we have done. We have commissioned a review uh, and um, we have had legal advice on, on our options and, um, and those are being shared with Suez. There are conversations with Suez on a on a daily, very regular basis uh, around issues. Uh, arising from this contract, um, but I think we're now we're now clear on, on what what those options look like. I'm afraid they are there. There is a commercial sensitivity about those at the moment, uh, and those will be explored in in part two um, uh, of this agenda, which I'm afraid is not open to to the public. Um, all I can say is that um, uh, we all want to uh, uh, to see this resolved, uh, and uh, we will now push forward. Um, as quickly and as firmly as we possibly can uh, to achieve that. Um, 
I, I don't know if there are some others. I think, Natalie Bramhall, are you going to pick up some of the specific points that residents have raised? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, I have responded to all the residents that have contacted me um, already uh, earlier on today. And as you've already alluded to, um, the County Council are obviously very concerned about the delay. And, and as you've said, we're addressing this at the highest level with Suez. Um, to confirm, the Eco Park will only move into operation and be accepted by this council if and when it passes a thorough series of tests to prove its operation is both safe and reliable. Although for reasons of commercial confidentiality, we're limited in what we can share in respect of this work. We're doing uh, and what we're doing to manage the contract. I can assure members and our communities and residents that officers and all cabinet members are working really hard to protect the interests of the council and, uh, and, and critically our taxpayers' value for money in the delivery of this contract and the associated construction program. Um, uh, the, the, the leaders already uh, covered the part two of the report, which uh, which is, is very difficult to uh, talk about. Um, but um, I want to, to, to take this uh, time to re recognise the issues that have been raised by residents um, in regard to the current operation. Uh, we've received a large number of messages from local residents setting out their concerns over a number of aspects uh, of the eco park, including strong odours um, and uh, emergency noise and the traffic generated by the construction. And I'm really sympathetic to residents that have raised these issues. And I'm grateful that you've come forward with your concerns. And I want to uh, provide some reassurance that emissions from the stack are continually monitored and sewers are required to comply with strict emissions that are set out um, in their environmental permit. The operation of the plant under the terms of the environmental permit is regulated by the environmental agency and to ensure that it does not cause any harm to the environment or to human health. If the emissions monitoring identifies any concerns, the environment agency can and will close the site down. To this end, we are actively pushing for SUS to engage with the environment agency on the back of these complaints and we've been that we've been made aware of. And we remain grateful to residents in the surrounding area for advising us of the issues experienced. We obviously will continue to work with residents in the area to support a resolution of their concerns. And we would encourage all residents writing to us to ensure that they are also making their complaints directly to SUEZ, as it is SUEZ that are required to investigate all complaints of pollution and report the outcome to the Environment Agency. In addition, residents can report these directly to the Environment Agency, which again will help ensure that all these matters are investigated and resolved as soon as possible. We've also been made aware of noise issues and the traffic complaints specifically re re uh, related to the construction of the plant, and we will be investigating in our role as a relevant planning authority. I can assure residents and members that we are proactively working to ensure that the relevant authority is taking the steps required to address the issues raised in the operation of this eco plant. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Sinead. Thank you, Leader, and thank you for persevering with my uh, IT issues. Um, I um, have also received the uh, numerous correspondence from local residents um, and I'm very grateful for being given the opportunity to talk on this paper today. Um, the contacts we've had, as uh, Councillor Bramhall has said, have been about a range of issues, including noise, loud alarms, antisocial antisocial hours. And of course, we're all taking this very, very seriously. And whilst we do accept aspects of the site are not working and that high level discussions are ongoing, we remain very concerned about the local impact. So as an elected member for Spellthorn, and I know my Spellthorn cabinet colleagues will join me, I recognise the impact the issue at the Eco Park has on residents. And in agreement with the leader and cabinet member, and I'm very grateful for that, and with the support of my Spellthorn cabinet colleagues, I would like to engage with the local residents, in particular the Residents Association, SATAP, and those who have written to us 
by offering a proposal to set up a working group. And we will reach out to these groups and residents in the next few days to ensure this happens and happens quickly. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sinead. Um, I think that will be very helpful. I think it's, it's you know, the, I'm afraid that the, many of these issues are outside of the control of the County Council. Um, they are down to sewers. Um, that doesn't mean in any sense that we're going to walk away from them or ignore them. You know, our role here now is to push forward in the conversations with sewers, uh, you know, uh, and and to, uh, uh, to to follow the, the or to choose one of the options that, the, that we have um, that have been set out by our legal advisors and that that we will we definitely will be doing um so uh, thank you for picking up the specific residents issues and and to natalie uh, and no doubt we'll um we'll 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 hear more about those um in due course is there anybody else that wishes to raise anything on this item um there is just one recommendation which is we note the contents of the report uh, and that a review of the current waste pfi contract has been undertaken and in, in uh, part two in, in the non-public part of this agenda, we will be uh, taking forward uh, uh, at least one of those options. So can I take it that that recommendation is agreed, please? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. So the last item on the public agenda is item 18, which is an update on our current financial uh, position from Mel Few. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Leader. Uh, this report covers the halfway stage of the financial year. And at the halfway stage, there have been further progress to closing the budget gap, which we reported on last month, uh, by about 1.2 million, leaving 3.5 million gap to close by the end of the financial year. It should be noted that continued pressure in children's services, where the projected overspend for the year is 11.2 million, continues to increase, which is mainly due to the rising costs from the high needs block, which is projected to account for 68% or 7.6 million of the services unfavorable forecast, with the remaining overprojection attributed mainly to the higher volume of looked after children, much of which has arisen during the COVID uh, pandemic area impact on the service. The rising waste costs continue to impact the results of the environment, transport and infrastructure services and uh, is currently under investigation to see how we can reduce that gap. As advised in previous meetings, the budgets have been reset in taking into account the 52.5 million receipt of COVID expenses and these are now set out in Table 2 where the budget has been increased from 969.1 million to 1021.6 million or 1.0 billion. First time I've ever said billion in county monthly report. The impact of COVID-19 on the year's results is set out in paragraph three through paragraph eight in the report. And in summary, the situation is that the total cost of COVID-19 to the council is 78 million pounds of which the council has received uh, the following receipts, general refund of additional expenditure and lost income of 52.5 and specific funding for test and trace infection control, etc. of 25.5. As the leader mentioned earlier, not all the funding has been received, but it is expected shortly. The public health grant was increased in the year by 2.4 million, of which 0.8 was utilised to fund the NHS agenda for change pay award. The Cabinet is asked to approve the balance of 1.6 be transferred to the public health budget for use in areas such as mental health, suicide prevention as part of Surrey, Surrey's health and wellbeing priorities. The capital expenditure position reflects additional expenditures being allocated to highways of 1.6 million for the delay in two specific projects offset by lower forecasts in other areas. The details are again set out in paragraph 15 and 16 of the report. The Cabinet is asked to approve an empty property proposal. The details are set out in Annex 3 of the report. This is an innovative concept, approved, which approved will um, encourage district and borough authorities to reduce the number of empty properties within their areas. Where individual boroughs change the empty homes county tax policy, on evidence of such, the county will refund the additional county tax on those properties collected to the borough as an incentive to reduce the number of empty properties. 
At each quarter, the Cabinet is presented with certain pertinent data on the debt due to the Council, the Treasury update, and returns on invested surplus cash um, over the last quarter. On the debt side, the Cabinet will note that the debt due to Council at the end of September amounted to $52 million, of which Adult Social Care accounts for 55.4% or $29 million. A new item of 12.3 has arisen, 12.3 million I should say, has arisen, which represents a claim for a refund of expenses incurred by the council, which directly related to COVID and will be reclaimed from health in due course. Turning to the four recommendations, the council should note the uh, forecast of revenue and expenditure budget for the year. It should approve the reset of the budget uh, from the uh, incorporating the COVID uh, to the additional envelopes and approve the allocation of 1.6 million health service investment um, into the budget and approve the carry forward for the remainder of the 1.6 allocated to the public health service and finally approve the empty property proposals as contained in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Any, um, any comments from anybody on that? It's all, um, all very self-explanatory and generally moving in the right direction, which is, uh, which is uh, positive. Um, okay, no, in the absence of any comments, then, uh, as Mal says, there are um, five recommendations. Um, perhaps if you could just all confirm those are agreed. 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 Okay, thank you very much. So that uh, that brings us to the end of um, the public agenda. Um, thank you um, for uh, to anybody that was uh, watching. Um, I hope you'll see that there are lots of positive things that are happening, lots of activity, um, you know, it, despite um, COVID-19. I hope that by the next time we meet as a cabinet, um, you know, we will, um, uh, you know, we will have moved on. Um, we'll see what uh, what further restrictions, if any, are imposed on Surrey. Um, but uh, we'll continue to do what, whatever we can to protect our residents uh, and indeed the businesses uh, across um, the county. But I think we should all uh, feel a little bit more optimistic that, that actually the light is at the end of the tunnel um, for this pandemic. I certainly hope so. I'm, I'm sure we all do. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, no doubt um, look forward to catching up in due course.